Hi, everyone. We'll go ahead and get started. Welcome to today's 10-minute webinar on Color Spaces 101. Presenting today is Tim Mile, the Applications Engineer, Engineering and Technical Support Manager at XRite. I'm Robert Grotans, the Global Technical Marketing Manager, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. Just a few things to go over before we get started. Due to the number of people that are attending today's webinar, we will keep everyone muted. If you have any questions, please use the questions function on the GoToWebinar panel. Tim will have time to answer a couple at the end. If we don't get to your question, we'll try to follow up afterwards. Finally, this webinar will be recorded and you will receive a link so that you can review the webinar at your convenience. So with that, I'll turn it over to Tim to kick it off. Thank you, Robert, um, and thank you all for joining us today. Um, as you can see on the screen, um, we're diving into what I'm calling Color Spaces 101. Um, where do they come from and what exactly do they mean? And if we're involved in color measurement at all, we're going to live in the world of color space. So we're going to do this very simply and start by talking about what exactly is a color space. So we may see any of these things pop up in our work, LAB, CMYK, XYZ, RGB. I like to call all of this, and this is kind of a tongue-in-cheek um, image here, the alphabet soup of, uh, of color. And I love this picture because sometimes it's, uh, it's frustrating and you, and you make it to the point of screaming that you need help because there's so many different ways to describe color. They all work, but they aren't all the same. And, and, and how do I relate those ultimately to what I see? Color measurement is all about mimicking um, or helping us determine if color is good or bad, and that needs to relate to what we see. So let's talk more, more, um, more definition, what exactly is a color space? What are we talking about? So we are talking about a three-dimensional description of color. It's a way to describe color in three dimensions. And, the, and why three dimensions? Well, the early um, scientists involved in this, like Munsell and, and others, um, determined that it, it made sense since we describe every other object on Earth um, by, its, by three dimensions, its length, its width, and its depth, or its longitude, latitude, and altitude. Okay, so we're going to describe a color the same way. We're going to describe it three-dimensionally, um, and, and the good news of a color space is if I can describe one color, then I can describe two colors and talk about their difference. So we're going to use three dimensions. We're also going to use numbers to define these dimensions. Makes sense. If I'm describing to you the size of a box, I'm going to give you inches or millimeters or centimeters or whatever to describe its length, width, and depth. I'm going to use numbers because they, you, you can understand them and it describes it. So we're going to use numbers as well, but there's an issue here. Um, you know, it's great. We're going to use numbers to describe a color in a color space, but I don't see numbers when I look at color, and I suspect you don't see numbers either. You see color, and you have a reaction to it. So how do we, so why are we using numbers? Well, what's the point? Well, words alone are not accurate means to describe color or color difference. And as an example, um, words alone are not a great way to describe temperature either. Um, I can use the words hot and cold. Now, hot, if I'm talking about a cup of coffee, may mean one temperature. Hot, if I'm talking about um, the burners on my stove, it may be a different temperature. And hot outside might even be a third temperature or cold for that matter. Um, as an example, what, you know, if I ask someone who lives in Anchorage, Alaska, um, what temperature they consider cold, I suspect that that number is significantly lower than if I ask someone who lives in Atlanta, Georgia, the exact same question. So, um, <laughs> The words have different meanings to different people. Um, in color, we often, um, some, one way that some people will describe a, um, a more saturated color versus a less saturated color is they use the words dirty and clean, but we can argue about that as well. 
Um, my wife and I sometimes argue about whether or not the shirt I'm going to wear is dirty or clean, right? Um, th there's lots of different meanings to words. So why do we use numbers? Well, you know, 7.5, that means the same thing to every customer or every person who ever looks at that number. In fact, the unique thing about numbers is we don't even need to translate them into other languages, right? Words, the same word has different meanings and to different people and different who speak different native languages and all those kinds of things, but the numbers are good. So that's why we're using numbers. So let's move into how we're going to use those numbers. I'm going to talk about the two most commonly used color spaces for color measurement. Um, and those are first LAB, um, or what we call typically called C-Lab. Um, there was a precursor to this called Hunter LAB, which was very similar. And in the LAB color space, we've got an L value, which represents from lightness to darkness going up and down in this particular um, image. We've got A, which in a positive direction indicates redness and in a negative direction indicates greenness. And we've got B, which is, as you can see, positive yellow, negative is blue. And so I can plot colors inside of this space. Um, and again, I can plot multiple colors and calculate differences and say this one's lighter or darker or redder or greener or yellower or bluer or some combination of all of that. The other um, fair, common color space is LCH, which is directly related to LAB. In fact, the L value is exactly the same in both of those color spaces. But what LCH does is rather than use Cartesian coordinates like LAB, it uses something more like polar coordinates where we've got an angle, red is zero, yellow 90, green 180, and so on, and a chroma or saturation kind of metric, the C, is how far away from the center of that color space am I? Because the bright colors are all way on the outside and the neutral colors are all sitting there in the middle. So we've got LAB and we've got LCH, um, and we'll talk about them a little bit more, but first I wanna give you an analogy. Um, this is a, a color space analogy I've been using for years. This is literally the first time I've ever actually tried to show it without drawing it because it's not possible for me to easily draw for all of you. So I want you to imagine this building, which is round, and let's assume that it's 100 stories tall. And in the very center of this building, we have what, I call the L levator. Um, yes, an elevator like you ride up and down, but it's also representing the letter L for for our color space, lightness and darkness. And so at the ground floor, that elevator is black, and at the top floor, it's white. And in the middle, I get all these different shades of gray. So if I have an L value of 50, I might be halfway up that, and I'm at a, a, a gray that's halfway between black and white, essentially. If I then were to walk off that elevator in this building in what we'll call the positive A direction, I'm going to move toward that red. And at the edge of the building, it might be a very bright red. Halfway between the elevator and the bright red is a duller red, a less saturated one, maybe. And the same is true if I go in the positive A, or positive B direction toward yellow or negative B direction toward blue. It's just a good way to kind of visualize in your mind how I'm plotting this color three-dimensionally. So if I can plot one, I can plot two, and then I can calculate what are the values most of us are used to using, which are these D, L, D, A, D, B, D, C, D, H. The D stands for delta, which simply means difference. So I've measured my target, my standard, the color I'm trying to produce, I measure a sample, and I can calculate a difference between them to know, okay, is my color acceptable? If it is, life is good and I ship the product. If it's not, knowing these things, if let's assume I'm using LAB, I may find out, oh, my color is lighter, but it's only a little bit lighter. Um, oh, it's a lot redder than my target and maybe a little bit bluer. Well, if it's a lot redder, it may tell me that I need to add some green to it. I'm being over simple, simplistic here, but I think you get the, you, you get the gist of what we're saying, right? So I, yeah, it, it will help me 
give direction to how do I fix this? And what I found in my years of experience um, working with people in color is that most companies or most um, industries either speak, I say speak like it's a language, either speak LAB because that's the way that they talk about color or they speak LCH. They both are describing essentially the same thing, right? But they're just different ways of describing it. And so it's, um, it, it's a choice of which what, what you're comfortable with. Either of them will work. Um, but these color differences calculated within a color space are giving us the answer. Now, I will say not a lot of people are using LAB or LCH as their pass fail. That tends to come into these things we call delta E's. So let me put up there really quickly. All right, we've got a whole bunch of different delta E's. Um, delta E's are great because it's one number that represents the total color difference. And I can say I want everything below one to pass and everything above one to fail or two or 1.5 or whatever number. Easy, right? Single number makes it really quick decision. I can look at that number and know whether my sample is good or bad. The problem with delta E's is, well, first of all, it's only a color difference and not a color space. So if my delta E tolerance is one and my sample is 1.5, all the delta E tells me is it fails. It does not tell me why, right? In order to know why, I need a color space. Now, all the delta E calculations come from a color space. And so they help, they are, they are derived from that. So we're living in either LAB or LCH to calculate all of these. Um, but ultimately only a color space can tell me which direction to move. And if I'm going to do color measurements and find out I have color that is unacceptable, the very next thought in your mind is how do I fix it? And a color space gives you that. So while most people will use a delta E type of calculation, one of these to do their pass fail, they're using the LAB or the LCH color space to help them know what do I do to go make bad color better. So we tout this as a 10 minute webinar. I think I went to 12. Um, we're actually at a point for questions. If you have questions and you want to post them in the questions tab. We would be more than happy to answer those. If you wanna post questions now and, and um, or as you're thinking of them and we need to respond to them later, we are more than happy to do so. Um, I'll reiterate, as Robert said, um, this was all recorded and so you will get a copy of the recording of this webinar um, and it will be available um, to you to, to review. Um, which, um, whichever parts of it you might find useful or share with others. So a um, couple of questions starting to pop in and um, I'm gonna grab a couple here and, and, um, and give you an answer. So one, someone asked about LAB um, in Photoshop. <laughs> um, is it Hunter LAB or CIE LAB? And I'm going to, and I don't know the answer specifically to Photoshop, but I'm going to talk about that anyway because it's an important point. Everybody calls their LAB LAB, right? Whether they're using Hunter LAB or they're using CIE LAB or C Lab, um, the scary thing is that people tend to just label it. Um, I truly believe that Photoshop is using CIE LAB um, and that. Um, they're simply labeling it as LAB because it's a common way for us to talk about it. Hunter LAB was created in 1945. CIE LAB was created in 1976. Most of the people in the world are using CIE LAB, right? To be completely accurate, it should always be labeled as either CIE LAB or L star, A star, B star with little asterisks or stars next to them. But um, it's best if you just get something labeled LAB to always ask what, um, what specific LAB value somebody is referring to, okay? Um, 
and then another one other question last question i'm going to answer i'm, get, I'm getting lots of them so i promise you we will get back to you with answers um but um another was asked um is it possible to get a passing delta e value and be visually rejected and the, the answer to that question is an absolute yes all right um it's entirely possible for that to happen typically it's because We've got a tolerance that's not set in agreement with visual assessment. So there's a number of things at play. Number one, are we sure that when we're doing visual assessment, we're in a light booth, a controlled environment, looking under the same illuminant source in the light booth that we use to do the color calculations in the software? In other words, if my software is set to do it under daylight and I go to a, and I look at it visually in my office under a fluorescent light, well, they're going to disagree because the two different lights will cause the color to look differently. So we need to make sure that we've made everything equal. But even with everything equal, if we're under the same light source, all that, we can still have a disagreement. Um, and some of that leads us towards refining a tolerance. Perhaps the tolerance is too loose or too tight to um, cause us a disagreement with visual. So there's lots of ways to try and adjust that. Um, we've actually done a webinar in the past talking a bit about um, uh, tolerancing and adjusting that. Those webinars we've done in the past are also recorded and, and available to you. If you go and register on our website, you can get ac access to them. Um, so hopefully that answers that particular question. As I said, um, I think we're up to about I don't know 30 or 40 questions. So we're we will we will we will give you the answers to those. Um, I will most likely actually answer them answer them all in in uh, in a, in one mass email, and anybody who asked a question will get it get the answers and and we'll provide those as well. So um, let me end by by thanking you all for joining us. Um, hopefully this was helpful for you. Um, if it did indeed create questions, as you can see on the screen, a number of different ways for you to contact us directly. Um, if you want to ask your question um, in a more urgent manner, if you need if something you need an answer to today, otherwise um, you can look forward to us uh, getting back to you in in some um, in in a recent response sometime next week. So thank you all again for joining us, and everyone have a very good day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.